welcome and thank you for coming. I'm especially uh, pleased that we have a very different crowd today from our usual crowd. A uh, lot of uh, French people, a lot of women. <laughs> and one Japanese. <laughs> so, so thank you for coming. We have a very exciting program today. And so first what I'll do is just give you a brief introduction to, to the hive itself. And, and so what we do is, uh, many of you know us because we organize events almost every week on some aspect or the other of, of data. So around data infrastructure, data science, data visualization, data apps, and today, you know, around art and media related to data. And, and so we have um, talks, panel discussions, Peter, where's Peter? Peter had uh, has spoken a few few weeks back. Um, last week we had a, a panel discussion on use cases in, in high-tech industry. Um, so we hold a variety of different events. Many of you uh, know Pashu. Pashu is about to have a baby. Yeah. So so we have Viba, where is Viba? Viba, stand up. Viba is filling in for Pashu. <laughs> Is that for you? Or is that for and, me? and so we thank our sponsors who, who support the Hive Think Tank. Uh, and, and especially we thank NetApp who who's helped provide the facilities, the food, the wine, and really very great results. Um, just briefly, kind of what is the Hive? Hive basically, Hive incubates, funds, and launches companies in the big data space. And very specifically, we are focused on data-driven applications. Relative to uh, venture capital structures, this is a very high-touch model. So we work very actively with companies. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Kelly Sikat, who is director of the Artists in Residence program at Montalvo Art Center. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, thank you. This is a different crowd for me, too. So thanks for having me. So I'm Kelly Seacat. I run the Artist Residency Program and the Arts Program at Montalvo. And how many of you have been to Montalvo Arts Center? So quite a few of you know who we are and what we do. We're about 175 acres. We're a public park. We're a historic property. We're a concert venue. We're a wedding venue. But we're also an artist residency. At the sort of first entrance, when you get into the property, there's about 10 artist live work studios built up the hillside. And we have about 60 artists who come to visit us from around the world each year. The artists come to us through a nomination process. We have visual artists, writers, filmmakers, performers, um, culinary artists who spend time with us. It's, it's a pretty special place. And, and what I said to somebody tonight is I sort of follow our artists. And when they want to investigate something, I go along like the guinea pig and figure at some point if I can kind of understand what they're thinking about, then we can help translate it to other people. Because I think what artists do is help to interpret information, ideas, concepts, and sort of current thinking. And clearly, big data and Silicon Valley is what people are thinking about. <clears throat> so I'm pleased to be here tonight. I'm pleased to introduce Daniel Conacher. Daniel is a media-based artist, filmmaker, um, photographer, visiting us from Madrid, Spain. This is Daniel's second visit with Montalvo. Daniel came and spent some time with us last year while we celebrated our centennial year. And for us, it was really important to engage as much of the public in our artistic program as possible. And so Daniel said, well, this is great. I have this beautiful work, Asalto, which we loved. And he said, if we just drape the villa, we can project people crawling and we can have Asalto Montalvo. And so we opened our, our arts program last summer for our centennial year. Daniel created a green screen on the front lawn and and we had about 500 people participate in crawling up the villa. We also had a dance performance choreographed to be projected onto the villa, and it was quite a special night. So now Daniel's back, sort of doing his own investigation in Silicon Valley, and um, big data's where he's landed. So I'm gonna turn it over, I'm gonna give it to you. <coughs>
thank you all for coming. I don't know if this works, but it's a small room. And then my phone. The back. Yeah, that would help. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you very much, Kelly, for the introduction, and also to Ravi and the Hi for well being so supportive of the work that I'm doing here in Silicon Valley. Um, diving into big data, um, I'm going to dive right into it in this talk. First of all, I'd like to kind of make a small clarification. Uh, as an artist, I, I am a visual artist. I don't conceive of art as something that serves the purpose of decorating, shall we say, fancy homes or hotel lobbies or something that can only be seen in museums. I think of art as a tool that helps me to understand the world I live in. And in that sense, it's an amazing tool. It helps me to process things that I don't understand, that sometimes overwhelm me, that sometimes confuse me. It really is a tool that allows me to situate myself, to position myself um, in front of uh, sometimes very complex, very challenging um, situations. So I have recently um, turned my attention to big data. And I think we've heard how it's been described many times as a new infrastructure that is still in its infancy, but that is changing totally how we relate to the world, how we measure and look and understand the world. As an infrastructure, it can be compared to aqueducts and Roman towns or the French encyclopedia or even the uh, transcontinental railroad uh, here in, in North America. But above all, it's, I think it can be understood as a paradigm change. A paradigm change where suddenly everything seems different. And art loves paradigm changes. Art feeds on paradigm changes. And when they have been happening in the past, in history, art has been there to try to understand and figure out what those changes are about. So, when we think of this paradigm change, um, of course, there are, there are uh, all kinds of changes. Uh, I guess one of the ones that I'm most interested in is what I almost feel like a total rewriting of what it means to be a human and what it means to perceive the world around us. Um, there are, of course, some phenomenal promises that come with big data. It is such uh, huge dilemmas and challenges as cancer or AIDS or climate change, ocean pollution that could perhaps be solved with the help of big data. There are more troubling aspects to big data and how our privacy issues and uh, indiv sense of individuality become eroded by, by uh, somehow feeling we're all part of this big system that's being, uh, that is watching us and controlling us. So, going back to, to art, understanding big data through art. I guess it really goes back to myself as an, as an individual, as a citizen, as an artist. How do I relate to the world of big data? And I, I do have to understand I come from the world of art. I am, above all, a visual artist. I work with technology, but this is a new area for me. How do I fit? How does little me fit? into such a massive phenomenon that seems to, well, totally erode any sense of individual volition in many ways. Let's think of the numbers. Some of the facts out there are incredible. 10% of the population is on Facebook. That means that 10% of the population is being tracked and all their posts are doing. 50% of all published materials since the invention of Gutenberg is, has been scanned by Google and is being analyzed. The NSA intercepts 1.7 billion emails, texts, and phone calls every day. So, again, how do I relate to this massive phenomenon? Well, I guess there's two options. One of them would be to just kind of walk away from all this and ignore it. But I think as an artist, I'm attracted to this, to this dilemma. How do I position myself? How do I create a sense of agency for myself? Uh, when thinking about big data. And art is one way, one my, is my tool to start thinking about it. So 
In the past, and I want to show you some examples of past work, how art has been extremely helpful for me to not be overwhelmed and kind of uh, somehow become totally numbed and, uh, and isolated from you know, the world we live in, but uh, it has allowed me to engage with it. And one of the areas I'd like to explore in, in some of my past work as examples is, is the notion of excess. We live in a world of excess. And I'm not alone when we complain of the excess of emails that we get every day, the excess of information, how we are bombarded by all this, but we're also addicted to it, how we're constantly checking our emails. We live in a world that we cannot process everything that is constantly coming at us. And I, as an artist, have found that what is not processed usually ends in the, in the dump, in the city dump. So I started visiting city dumps, and I became very interested in almost like, almost like an archaeologist trying to, understand, uh, trying to understand our culture by what we throw away. This is one of my favorite um, dumps. It's in the outskirts of Madrid. Uh, it's right next to the airport, so it combines two things that are really important for me. One is airplanes, and the other one is garbage <laughs> in one place. The airplanes literally fly over your head. Is So this kind of new landscape that is created by, by a society that is of calculated obsolescence, where we're constantly throwing things out, becomes one that I become very interested in, in trying to understand this world of excess. It's like a very material example of excess. One that, by the way, I find a lot of beauty in. For example, a dumpster full of burnt out light bulbs. They look like diamonds. They look like <laughs> coral. They look like anything but something that should be discarded. And as an artist, what I started doing was I started compiling a lot of these materials. A lot of them are technological and trying to reignite life back into them. So I'll start out with this piece, which is made with 4,500 burnt out light bulbs, which form a large curtain. And through a retro projection, I'm trying to reignite life back into them, almost like bringing back the memory of the light that once shone on these light bulbs. It's an interactive piece. There's a webcam hidden amongst the light bulbs it captures the presence of the public as they approach it. And when they do approach it, these kind of globs of light start following you. And then it, and it, and it elicits, immediately elicits a kind of playful attitude of, of almost like dancing in front of the screen. But above all, what is important for me is that the public, through this kind of luminous shadow, um, is activating the artwork and is kind of dealing with, again, with this excess of material and making it into something new, something that has a life. <clears throat> when there's nobody in front of the screen, you just have this quieter um, kind of spotlights that kind of travel through the screen. And I call it a screen as a sculptural screen. But it's really also thinking about um, our expiration date as individuals makes light bulbs that are burnt out also very human, and I over-identify with them. I really feel like we're all little light bulbs that shine for a few years, and then we, we dim out. This is, this is a detail where I just wanted to show where you can really get a sense of when the video projection hits, the, the light bulbs from behind, they seem to light up again. So the next piece I want to show you um, before I, I, I show you the video, I, want to, I won't be talking uh, while, it's, while we're seeing the video. It's formed with 360 DVDs of movies that I bought uh, for one euro in a flea market. And it's important for me where I found them because flea markets is usually where we go to find things that are, have disappeared or dying. Again, it's almost like the cemetery of technology for me, flea markets. All of these DVDs of movies, some were great, some were terrible, were viewed. I selected clips from each one of these DVDs, and that's what I'm projecting back on their surface. So let's, let's uh, watch that video. Get 
Come on, get your ass up. I think it's going to be a filtering process. Uh, <laughs> 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 Just name it. Uh, Lisa, I'll tell you a bull, Dredger. So installations like this one, it's called Sika, Sika Magnum, um, allow me to think about excess of narratives, of films, the uh, thousands of movies we see throughout our lives that are kind of floating and spinning in our heads, really trying to make some kind of cohesive sense of all these fragmented, excessive narratives that I can somehow pull together into this one piece. My art has also made me think a lot about what it means to have agency as a citizen. Uh, and I've done these public participation projects that have allowed me to really explore ourselves and our presence in public spaces. Some of the, some of the work I've done with public participation was actually um, kind of started out thinking a lot about uh, th these border jumps that happen um, in sub-Saharan Africans trying to get into Europe. There's something that happens a lot. Uh, hundreds of them storm the fences and they build these ladders and they jump into Spain. Um, and there's something extremely kind of, uh, well, very, very disturbing, but also a real sense of people just trying to kind of better their lives and become citizens. You know, this idea of wanting to belong and, and improve their life. The sense of jumping, an obstacle, is something that I've always been very interested in. Uh, how, how difficult it is for so many of us on this planet to have a life that we can, can, we can say is, is dignified. And, and this is, of course, is a very iconic image of, of uh, probably one of the most iconic images of, of the 20th century, a soldier jumping from East Berlin to West Berlin. So I've done a lot of projects that involve public participation, people climbing different obstacles from the Arcos de Lapa in Rio de Janeiro to a church in Rome. I've done this uh, in many t different situations. But since we're here in, in the South Bay, I wanted to show uh, the piece that Kelly was mentioning, Asalto Montaba, which we did to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the building, making participants not only just passive spectators, but active participants in the making of the work. So as they participate in the artwork, they, about after a minute when they participate, they get projected on the facade of the building. Beautiful. Come on, push each other more. 
That's it. That's it. <laughs> Don't let him go. Don't let him go. Pull him down. Pull him down. So as people participate, they're added to an ongoing loop. And uh, at the end of the evening, there's just literally hundreds of bodies climbing the facade of the, of the building. Beautiful, I love it. <laughs> so this this uh, the iterations of Asalto really change a lot from one location to another. This in this particular location, the public that participated were the neighbors of Greenpoint in Brooklyn, and this was the industrial part of uh, there were a lot of warehouses and old factories that uh, mostly through arson are getting burnt down to make way for luxury condos. They have a terrific view of Midtown Manhattan, so it's become very prime real estate. So it was very interesting to activate and involve neighbors. Uh, it's mostly Polish and Russian community. A lot of them and a lot of their relatives, parents had worked in some of these factories. So before this building was torn, torn down, it was a very kind of emotive uh, kind of uh, goodbye to this building. It's almost like claiming it before it completely disappears. Uh, so this had a, a very different feeling to, to what I did here in Montalvo. And again, there's this whole sense of the, the participants, as they're getting projected, it almost looks like they're holding on to elements of the facade, the windows and the columns, climbing up as almost like King Kong would climb the Empire State Building. A sense of wanting to kind of surpass the obstacles in their lives, I guess that's kind of like a very big, very fundamental metaphor for all of us. And then the third piece I want to show you is um, also a public participation installation. This is a permanent piece. I'll just, it, it's, it's, uh, it shows the making of this uh, LED piece that I have permanently installed. And if we could, I don't know if we could put the volume up a little bit because it may be a little bit low. My name is Daniel Canagar. I am a visual artist based in Madrid, Spain. I work with new media. I'm particularly interested in working with artwork that uses moving images in a very sculptural way. The process in which this project came into place was really through my art dealer in New York City, Steve Sachs, and he was approached by Julie Kinzelman, who is an art consultant here locally in Houston, who was looking for artwork that would activate uh, the atrium uh, here in to Houston Center. We ended up narrowing down quite a few candidates out of, you know, 30 to about five, and Daniel Kinnegar was among them. And so in many meetings with the clients and uh, several presentations in describing different candidates and their capability, Daniel really rose above the rest of them. And Daniel's use of video in a very non-traditional manner was very exciting, and we felt that that was a wonderful opportunity to be able to give him the ability to create for this space, um, to push the media, to explore it in a different way than he had, and as a result, to give this wonderful gift, so to speak, to um, the building itself and certainly to the city of Houston. 
The artwork is called Waves, and the reason I decided on this title is because I was very inspired by the waves of people that throughout the day travel through the atrium, and this is something that I want to convey in the final artwork, this, this kind of flowing emotions. Another element that's important for me is that the models that I use for the artwork are uh, workers that work here in the, in the building, tenants, tenant owners here that are part of the the day-to-day -day, uh, life of this building. And uh, for me, it's also uh, interesting to be able to use them, to have used them uh, via green screen events in the, in the final production of the video. It will give them a very special connection, I hope, to the artwork. They'll be able to come in every morning and maybe see themselves. When I was finally awarded the commission, I knew I did not want to replicate what I had already done as an artist. It's uh, for me very important to keep on pushing the boundaries of what is possible. There was a major technological challenge for what I had envisioned. That involved creating LEDs and more specifically LED tiles that could be curved and they could be twisted. So I have this kind of double torquing tiles that would allow me to create these interesting, um, audacious curves. There's a total of 616 tiles. There's a metal structure um, that allows us to magnetically place the tiles onto the metal structure. And then behind the metal structure, all the LEDs are daisy-chained by HDMI cables. opportunity to collaborate with an overall team to, to uh, allow this piece to materialize. Um, I think furthermore, it's, it's really wonderful for Houstonians to have this in our own backyard as well. This is the first large-scale piece that Daniel has created in the United States, and here it is in Houston. And so it's been a really great opportunity for all of us. As an artist, I'm aware that Houston has a pretty significant public art uh, presence. I think it is recognized internationally as a place where public art is really being supported. Just driving around downtown Houston, you can see some major work. So I am I'm really honored to have been able to have an addition uh, to, to that significant uh, tradition of public art. I'm hoping the piece uh, will be enjoyed by, by those that use the space, that come to the space. For me, it's been a real uh, honor to, to, to have such a, such a presence, you know, to have such an important piece for me in such an important location. These are examples of work in which I, I engage uh, the public and engage, in this case, tenants in the building or just the general public in the making of the work as a way of giving them agency, of making them be able to express themselves in, in, the, in the public space, something that we're finding harder and harder to do. Um, so if we're talking about excess is one way of, one thing I've explored through art, public participation, and, and then I'd like to speak about third element before then I, I start talking a little bit about my big data project and, and it's materializing the intangible we are visual animals we need sometimes visual material evidence in front of us to really comprehend and make sense of different phenomena and this is something that I, I've learned myself something that I look for myself I, I love this image of just a pile of computer electric and telephone cables found in a junkyard all in a, in a wireless society, this will gradually become more and more obsolete. But I'm kind of fascinated by, by uh, this sense of uh, overload of communication that somehow I wanted to materialize through art, uh, through these little, for example, clusters of a Cat5 cable. A projection in the pedestal projects upwards towards the cables simulating a sense of uh, energy traveling, coursing through the, through the cables, almost like bringing back the memory of these elements, of, of, of these materials, of the data that once traveled through the cables. 
It's a very much an archaeological piece. In fact, the pedestals are kind of designed as something you would find in a, in a museum, an archaeological museum, as a find from the past. And also a great sense of organic, uh, feeling very organic, almost like a, a sense of hearts or brain even. After all, we build a lot of these artifacts using ourselves as models. I've also tried to materialize the, uh, the, the sense of internet, of the, this global brain that we now call the internet through this piece called Scanner. Similar idea to the previous piece I was just showing you. These are it's a very large space, exhibition space, seven projectors, um, a lot of clusters and knots of cables found in junkyards. And just by projecting and scanning these white lines, you get this sense of, of data kind of traveling from one part uh, from one uh, circuit to another. So it's a walkthrough experience, and for me this is a really important element of these installations. You're not just supposed to look at them passively, you're supposed to experience them, you're supposed to see them from different angles, you're supposed to uh, really um, walk through them. And, they're, and, they're, and they tend to be very uh, kind of hypnotic and uh, engaging. So this is an, an attempt, again, of trying to materialize something as intangible as data flow. And here I'm going to start wrapping up a little bit, because big data, I think, has a big problem. And I would say that the problem is, is a visibility problem. It is a phenomena that is basically involves every aspect of our lives, and yet it's invisible. We can't see it. And I think the problem is there's a disconnect between those of us that are heavily involved in technology, like here in Silicon Valley, and the general population. The general population does not understand, conceive big, big data at all. And this is a problem. There's a perception problem. And um, something that is affecting society in such a fundamental way needs to be explained and brought to the public in ways that they can understand and grasp. Um, I think that art is a really interesting tool to do that. Art can allow us to understand and visualize what big data is about. And there's a lot of, uh, there's some artists that are already working with data visualization. I just wanted to show two or three examples. Uh, this is uh, Aaron Koblin, who's one of the, I would say, the um, pioneers in data visualization. Uh, this is, um, for example, his New York Talk Exchange, which streams live data of all the phone calls and text messages coming out of New York City and where, where they're connected to in the world. This is a local piece here in San Jose, Andrea Poli and Chuck Varga, Particle Falls. It's a projection, projection on the side of a building, data visualization, of uh, pollution, air pollution in the area. And then many of you may have seen eCloud in the San Jose airport uh, by um, Dan Goods, Nick Hefferman, and Aaron Koblin, which uh, has some OLEDs in the ceiling of the terminal. And uh, those LEDs are reacting to real time data about weather in different cities in the world. So these are clear examples of artists attempting to visualize data in, some, in a way that's very kind of physical and very visually kind of understandable. So I think that's a really important step, but I would like to go a step further. And this is what I'm proposing here. The piece is called Search, and it's an immersive experience in big data. So this is a proposal. This is a proposal that I'm working with in collaboration with the Hive and with the Montalvo Art Center. And it's kind of working from the ground up. Um, but above all, it's an immersive experience. Some of the themes that I want to explore in the work uh, are related to my past work. Excess of data, certainly big data is about excess. 
How do we deal with so much information, with so much data? How do we give it form? How do we give it value? That's one of the big questions that big data tries to do. So that's something that I want to negotiate in, my, in this art installation. Have visitors through public participation activate the work. If the visitors are not in the installation, the art experience, the artwork doesn't exist. So that's another component I want very present in the artwork. And then again, this idea of materializing the intangible, helping visitors to cognitively process and understand big data, to help them integrate big data as something that they experience that they, as part of their life. So I'm going to be a little more specific now uh, describing this installation I want to do. But I wanted to show these kind of images, kind of uh, inspirational images, really thinking about big, da big data, not as something that is out there in computers and in networks and on the cloud, but something that gets imprinted on our skin, almost like a second skin or like tattoos. And that's what the piece is going to be. It's going to be a large, dark space with multiple projectors that are projecting onto the, the public. And what they're going to be projecting is data streamed in real time, and that covers their bodies, as I was saying before, almost like, like a second skin. And the third element that's going to be important of search is how their movements in this space are going to be, um, through video mapping technology, precisely projected on their moving body. So as they're moving, the projection will be constantly adapting to the movements, of, the natural movements of the body, only projecting on their bodies, not on the back walls of the exhibition space. So the idea is to create a very physical, physical, tangible, sensorial experience of data, of the excess of data. And this is an important element. I want it to be a lot of data because data is big, and so it has to, has to be a big experience. What is also for me important is that participants, it's not just an individual experience. I'm hoping that this um, project will involve many players, many people in this simultaneously in the same space, that they can observe data being projected on others, and they can even maybe connect the way social media connects us. Here we can physically reconnect, touch each other, and data can flow from one uh, person to another. Uh, the artwork will have different modes of the experience. We could just, just project only on the bodies. Another mode would be to leave uh, what they call the digital exhaust or a digital trail behind us, like a smoky cloud that could be projected on the walls. Uh, this sense of data being exchanged between different participants in the installation. And why does data you know, I'll have to be only visualized in one way, it could change shape or color, be more abstract, more realist. So above all search, I want it to be a very visually compelling piece. And when I say visually compelling, I, and this is something that I do a lot of my work, is really pull people in from the distraction of everyday life as a way of also making them think about what they're experiencing. I want it to be very playful. I want to encourage play, uh, interaction amongst the visitors, and above all, I want people to feel and cognitive, pr cognitively process big data. Um, I'm right now um, looking for production needs uh, to develop search. I need some engineers. Uh, I need access to data, uh, financial sponsorship to fund it, and a venue to present the final artwork. So as you can see, I'm really starting from scratch here. <laughs> So I'd like to just finish off by saying that I really, truly believe that a society without art is one that eventually will die. And I think that art can be big data's consciousness. It can bring humans back into the picture. It can also give us a sense of agency and empower, empowerment over our tools, rather than just feeling we are slaves of them. So art is very good at exploring complex, difficult issues, such as big data. And it can help us pull away from a sense of numbness, of passivity, of just kind of accepting. And it can give us agency. 
it can help us to keep on searching, you know, this idea of search, and that's why for me the title of the piece is important. It can help us continue to search the world with a sense of wonder, with a sense of curiosity, with a sense of openness. Thank you very much. Here's my information. If you are interested in contact me, and um, if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. There's a, I think there's two components. There's in-kind sponsorship. So I imagine a space that is kind of like a warehouse space. And I think one of the interesting things about this uh, installation is it could be adapted to many different spaces because it's, in essence it's just a container for people to be able to move around in a dark space and become the projections. But I imagine a large, because I want a lot of people to participate, a very large warehouse-like space. Um, I don't think um, the first stage would be to create a prototype, and I don't need at that point. I don't need uh, too you know too much help. I just need like two or three software engineers that can help me start working with uh, streaming data. And once I have, uh, and this is how I usually work. I create small prototypes that then I scale to you know a much larger experience. Uh, so I have a kind of in kind sponsorship and help. Uh, I need access to streaming data, and that I need to get a company involved in. And then, of course, there's a financial component to be able to fund, uh, to rent a space, to well, f uh, pay for those engineers, etc. So, I don't know if that gives you a better idea of. That's just my um, question was like, even to create the prototype, what kind of I, th I think if I could, I would say that 125K would allow me to do more than a prototype, a prototype and then really like a full working version. That's kind of a number that I've estimated. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, what kind of data are you looking at? Political, economical, financial? Um, I kind of would like the, the mode of the art experience to shift. From one, and well, that could be one way of shifting from from one element to another. But it's really about quantity. So, for example, ideally, I would love to have every single query that's happening at Google, you know, through Google searches, that moment be projected on people's bodies. So that would be trans content. It would just be about the quantity of queries that are happening simultaneously. But then, as I say, I think there could be interesting to have different modes where that can suddenly become. As you say, just financial data that could be really interesting. So you can kind of switch to different modes and have different contents that would maybe change the, the experience of the piece. Um, but it's really, what I'm really looking at is to bathe the public in data. I want them to have, and that is really about quantity, because big data is very much about size. Size matters with big data, right? So it's very much about having this total deluge of of information on people's bodies. There's a real having a real tangible, tactile on this experience of it. Yes. So by projecting data on bodies, what do you think people will experience? What will they will they know what the data is and how will they translate it? They'll just see numbers on themselves or will they be learning something? Or will it just cause someone to think? I, I, what do you think will happen? I'm hoping, and again, you know, in a lot of my artwork, I have some preconceived ideas of what people are going to experience, and I'm usually very pleasantly surprised at how much more interesting their ideas are than the ones I had initially. Uh, and so I'm hoping this will also happen with this particular uh, art piece. But um, it's, yeah, I feel, I feel that we need to put our bodies into big data. And, and, and this is, I think, one way of doing it. We need to literally dive into big data in a very physical way, in a very tangible way that kind of we can kind of wrap our minds around. There's something, uh, you know, it's one thing to, it's like I've had this experience uh, with, like, for example, my, my uh, 
excursions to uh, junkyards. It's one thing to read artic articles about how much garbage we create. Another thing is to actually visit dumps and see this day in and day out, you know, what, how much, the quantity of what we throw out. So I want people to also have a very kind of visual, tactile experience just about that quantity <coughs> of data that's, that we are constantly creating. Uh, I think is, is, is so, and then hopefully that will allow them to begin to situate themselves with it, not something that just kind of happens out there, but something that they are involved in, that they're a part of, that they belong to. Uh, yes? I think that big data is not only about volume, but also about velocity and variety, because volume is an oversimplified view on data, as well as the beauty of big data, not in the quantity or um, even velocity or variety, but it's also in analytics. What you can predict and what you can prescript, those two types of predictive and prescriptive analytics would be something which might make your exposition kind of more, more enticing, so to speak, or m more activating if you can predict something or prescript by, by using this data. Yeah, that's a very interesting idea. And just, yeah, I mean, so much about big data is about finding patterns and about right. predicting uh, the certain patterns. So that's a definitely a very interesting uh, suggestion. Thank you. Yes? Regarding the patterns, the patterns emerge. The data, you got big data, then you got information, which is different between data and information. And I, percolating and condensing, analyzing, you see the patterns. You perceive something like that kind of transformation of the data is part of the exhibit. So you can see the raw data and then you can see how it transitions or is analyzed to produce more of a meaningful pattern. I don't, I don't think the, what I'm initially proposing is very much about uh, creating, uh, being able to see patterns. I really want people to have that kind of wash of, of, of the, the quantity, the volume. Um, I think, you know, as, as again, this, this was probably a piece that will evolve and develop, uh, but um, I think it's important to, to create this, for me at least, it's my, my point of departure is about volume and is about our trail, the trail that we're leaving behind collectively is something that is kind of even hard to begin to imagine what it's like. Uh, if we're just thinking of that as being projected on bodies, it would be really interesting to think of ways to be able to transform that into information that it's, that we can, you know, distinguish patterns in. Right now, I think that's about, I need to put my hands in, you know, again, this is a material that I need to start physically working with to really begin to uh, see what potential this could have, you know. But I need to get my hands dirty first. <coughs> okay. Yes. In terms of space, I was thinking, have you been to the San Francisco Exploratorium, the new one? I have not yet. So the new space I would think is a really good space for this kind of activity. Hmm. Do you know anybody there that you could? <laughs> Yeah, I will check it out for sure. Thank you. My last question. Peter. So, Daniel, I completely get that you're driven by this immersive degree to which we are completely surrounded by all of this stuff. But a lot of the other questions that kind of get to patterns, one of the kind of ironic things about big data is it's intensely personal. There could be all of this stuff, but what's interesting is it understands you, your patterns, what's unique about you. That's the thing that makes personalized medicine personal. It's the thing that makes marketing personal. And so the irony and the emotional thing is that while it's huge about everyone, it kind of is this deep insight about us. And that's part of the thing that just changes the nature of the human condition. It's like, oh my god, we're all known about it. And that strikes me as what the, the other kind of end of the pole of the thing that if it's emotionally exposed, people have a deep experience in understanding this phenomenon. Both its immersiveness and its unique personalness. And I, I'm not sure how you get at that, but it feels like those are the two big points of, of all this. 
Yes, I, that's very interesting because one of my initial ideas was to have personal data projected onto you. So as you're entering the installation, you could give in your face account or an IP address or something, and you'd have, you know, your emails or your Twitter or your last tweets or your Facebook posts projected on you, you know. And I thought that that would be really interesting. I think that could be like another one of the modes that could be plugged into the system, into the art experience. Uh, I don't want it to be the default experience because I think a lot of people will be really creeped out by that. <laughs> I think that, that as an individual wanting to have that experience, I think it would be really interesting. A lot of people were creeped out by your neck. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the point is, right, that, that form of controversy could be really interesting. There are various ways of getting at that, but I think it, it's a really interesting kind of... It's also it's a great community of people to invite in to kind of play with all this stuff. Because I think people who live in this world kind of understand, like if you invite people who work with it and ask just like what creeps you about it or what emotionally gets you, what a, you know, what a great vehicle to do that and amplify that. Yeah, no, that's definitely, I think that's very well taken. <coughs> yes, last yes. question. Real quick, uh, Dana, you mentioned that uh, something I think was very important early on, which was outside of Silicon Valley, uh, a great deal of people are still both confused as well as trying to understand what uh, big data is, uh, if I understand correctly, is what you said early on. Uh, my question for you really quick is, um, do you think that's because of the fact here science and art are actually merged as one? For example, as computer scientists and uh, analytics people and everything, mathematicians and everything else, art and science are kind of combined. Uh, would you argue that uh, that would be the case, or would you say that basically it's simply that um, outside of this area, uh, it's not seen as one and the same. I mean, I think it's it's just not seeing it and experiencing the same way. There's just so much more information, and, and you know, literally, this this is you know, hands on for for you know, 75 percent of the uh, people that work in Silicon Valley. It's just something that's like their everyday material that they work with. Um, I think that in general the population is feeling quite paranoid right now about big data. Uh, it's you know, almost completely related to NSA and probably nothing more than that. Um, I think there's a lot of aspects about big data that are being overlooked. Um, the discussion needs to be a lot more kind of complex and a lot more um, uh, you know, it has to be deeper than what is being discussed right now. So I, I, I think that I'm just, I think that there's a lot that needs to be done almost as an educational tool to, to really create a, a, a forum, you know, and I think some of these events, for example, I think are terrific in that way to create a forum to really think about what we want to do with this tool. And as Peter said in his talk a couple of weeks ago, he said the internet is open by design not by default, it was designed in that way. I hope I'm not misquoting you. But I think that something similar should be thought of when we're thinking about big data, and that's, that's kind of your point. We, we need to jump in, and, um, and, and, and I think the more of us that get involved, the better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all for being here. Getting out to celebrate art and, uh, and technology is pretty pretty cool. Um, so thanks for coming out on a weeknight. Thanks to the Hive for having me. Um, so this is something, actually, when I first saw the World Wide Web back in college, the first thing I thought of was, wait till that's in our heads. Um, and so that's what I figured is that we're going to end up with the desktop in our heads. And, and so that was 15 years ago or so. and. Uh, and then I, about four years ago, I embarked on this film. I um, actually went to school for film and got waylaid into clean energy for, for a long time. Uh, and I'm still, still there, which means the film takes longer than, it, than I wish. And then Google Glass came out, and I thought, damn, it beat us. Um, 
but I think that there's there's a couple reasons why that's actually been great because now people really get one of the things that we're doing in this film, and um, we've hopefully taken Google Glass a couple steps further. So the premise of the film is uh, again something I thought of 15 years ago or came across 15 years ago, which is the technological singularity. And how many people know what that is? Just so I know. Okay, about a third or a half of people. Okay, so the idea basically is that. Sooner or later, through some combination of either genetic engineering or artificial intelligence or people plus computers or computers on their own, we're going to make something smarter than us. And there's a good argument to be made we're already doing it in the sense that us, with our phones, we can look up things that we couldn't look up before. Um, in the film, we've chosen to have a separate AI um, become the first step in the singularity. What's interesting about that, there's stuff like Skynet and the Matrix and, and all that. Um, that have a smart AI, but what they don't do is take the next step that's really interesting in the singularity, which is if we make something smarter than us, it can make something smarter than it and in much less time than it took for us to make it in the first place. So maybe only a few days. And then that can make something smarter than that in even less time, and we end up with this intelligence explosion. And we have no idea what will happen on the other side. That's what I think. I, I read about it. Bernard Vinge, a science fiction author, came up with the idea quite a bit of time ago. And, and I just was blown away because, A, um, this is very likely to happen in our lifetime. And, B, it means that people talk about game changers. This is like changes absolutely everything. And the other thing that's cool about it is that we really don't know what the, will happen in the sense that we don't know if it's a disaster or if it's a rebirth. And there's people, very famous people, who are out there claiming they know exactly what's going to happen and that we're going to be uploaded or that we're going to be this or we're going to be that. But the truth is we have no idea what something smarter than smarter than us would do. And so I thought those moments, the days before that happens, the, if you knew it was about to happen, um, are just this kind of strange, wonderful, sad sort of feeling because you know that we've made, we finally made, we're the, the tool makers and we finally made the tool that out invents us. And we don't know whether that means we're going to be obsolete or whether that means we're going to get immortality in the machine or whether it's going to be benevolent or whether it's going to just destroy the world. So I thought that time was a really interesting piece of time for a film and um, especially an indie film where I didn't want to get into what would happen afterward. Um, lots of effects. We already have too many effects. Um, we're a little buried and we're trying to get them all done. But um, So that's the premise of the film. Uh, what I'm going to do is show a trailer, and then uh, because the film's going to be done probably at the end of November, and so you guys are going to get to see some stuff that we've never shown to anybody. It's a bit of work in progress. It's a lot of work in progress. You'll get to see how the sausage is being made. Stuff is not color timed. It's not sound corrected. It's not. There's all sorts of things that are wrong with it, and I'll be cringing. But um, I figure that that might make it interesting as we kind of struggle through some of this work in progress of how to visualize. Um, really big data. And so the, where that comes in is the AI itself. So what kind of AI would become smarter than us? Well, in the film, it's the AI that's watching us. It's the AI that's interpreting our big data. So the other big concept in the film is mixed reality and that we're all wearing um, a little interface device that essentially gives us our, our um, something like our cell phones, but it's full time and we all live in it, we can communicate with other people, and we all have our own interface. And this is the AI that's designed to serve us the ads that fit how we feel, what we're looking at, where we are. And so, of course, it makes sense that we're going to develop an AI like that to get through all this big data, because you need AI, um, for those who don't know, neural networks are a different form of intelligence than traditional parallel computing, where you're just looking at lines of code. Um, it's eventually composed of lines of code, but it really has a, it works in a similar way to how our brains work. And our brains are amazing pattern recognition devices. And so we wanted to visualize um, what kind of intelligence that might be that's watching us, and then what that might do as it goes along. So anyway, we'll watch the trailer, and that'll give a bit of an introduction. You've heard of the singularity? Sorry, I'm just going to full screen this here. If you don't mind. You've heard of the singularity? 
Have a seat for a second. You got humans, right? Intelligent apes. Call that I one. At some point, we make a machine that's smarter than we are. Call that I two. The I two can make something even more intelligent. I three. I three creates I four, and so on up the rabbit hole we cannot control. What happens next? film is actually, it's a little story against the big background, um, which, because it's an indie film, I think, and, and that makes it concrete um, to, to each person. What would you do if you had five days? And in this case, uh, we have the object of, of the film, the person that, that uh, the main character is trying to reach the whole film through is his sister, who he's been estranged from, and he realizes that this is about to happen, and Connie's here, so maybe when we do Q&A, you can come up, great. So... Um, I really like what you showed about the, the, the Twitter and the data representations, and I, I was looking at a lot of that stuff. Um, we've been trying to figure out how to visualize this AI, and we really didn't want to do the traditional hackers sort of Hollywood um, flying through uh, you know, big corridors of visualizing data. And we, we ended up having to do a little some of that because it's, it's hard to visualize data. Um, it's hard to make it and, and to make it tangible to the audience. And so we came up with the looking at the connections around the Earth, and we started looking at a lot of these, these maps of, of how data propagates. And so we visualized the, um, the, the AI mind, let's see, a little bit like this. And this isn't, this is preliminary, so. Um, artists we've got that started and we're going to start getting into getting into those nodes and expanding them and, and then there's people within each node and then those connections relate to people on the ground and we start seeing these spider webs there was that stuff in the trailer with the spider webs that's going to get a lot more complicated as we get the webs that as we all talk to each other as we communicate with each other that those webs are, are basically mapped um, and it's a lot of work trying to create something that looks like real data. So there's a lot of fractal stuff in there. Um, we've also got test footage, half of which I like, and some of which will be replaced. But the AI, one of the first things it does, as you can kind of see in the trailer, um, the question is always with the singularity, how would an AI like this take over? Um, and so in the film, one of the things it does is it blackmails people who are in a position to stop it. So it sends them information that it has, because it has all information on everybody. And so it's got every memory of yours, and you talk about the NSA. Um, if you own the data, you own the people. And actually, the, thing, the funny thing that people aren't talking about with this whole NSA thing, this is a little diversion, is that 
it doesn't matter so much what the NA knows about each one of us. What matters is that if you have all that data, you own the politicians. Because every politician has had to say something that they don't want out. And so the power of that is not just the power of it owning you or whether you've done something wrong, but whether um, someone else has. So anyway, that's, that's one of the first things it does is, is blackmails um, folks in a position to stop it. And then it goes after the Pentagon and a whole bunch of fun mm -hmm. stuff. So um, I'm not so sure about the second part there. I like the, the visualization of it going into the Pentagon. I think some of the hacker stuff um, with the access granted, we'll see if that, that stays in there. But, um, but I think the, the point, what we want to show is somehow the neural network, if somebody has ideas for this, how the neural network would interact with, with something that is more of a serial uh, style computer and how it hacks it and, and um, how it relates to it, I think would be interesting to get ideas. So um, now this gets into um, some early stuff we've done. Again, this isn't color time. Um, the, there's a bar scene where we, we get, uh, what we wanted was that each person's interface was specific to them. So unlike the iPhone or Google Glass, we don't have the universal glossy interface. We thought in a film it's much more interesting to be able to show characters by what their interface looks like. So is somebody's organized? Is it messy? Um, what's going on? In this case, we've got a character with a pink sort of, uh, <laughs> it's like a Hello Kitty style. Um, and it relates to her, as you'll see. My friends and I were traveling through Indonesia Oh my god, so amazing. Did you get to go to the Taj Mahal? You know, not really. We didn't get to go this time, but I'm sure we'll go again. We get to travel a lot. We're really lucky, you know? <laughs> oh, I agree. So, um, tell me about your company. <laughs> so, how we interact um, in this world, and we're already doing it, and so I think that's why everybody knows this is this is right where we're going. Um, let's see. So I wanted to say also because there's there's some of the people have been concerned about the trailer, and so there's also this kind of journey. I feel like it's one thing to have the the, um, the interfaces and the effects, but you need to ground it in somebody's story. And so this is just a little piece of um, the main character is trying to get uh, basically from San Francisco to Seattle. He's a bike messenger, loses his bike early on, and so he wakes up on a hillside. <laughs> big elements of the film is that it starts out very urban and then it goes out to suburbia and then out into nature and he actually ends up on this farm that's like a sort of ecotopia and I knew this place must exist in Northern California and sure enough it did and so it's a sustainable community and we don't have images of that but uh, it's this amazing place that, that people really have a sustainable community that they've built and there's cob housing and everything and so he has this question of whether or not to stay there or to continue his journey and of course he does um, giving something away, but um, this scene I put in just because I thought it might be entertaining, um, so uh, enjoy.
see your ID. Okay. We're making a delivery? Yeah, I'm delivering food. Do you guys give a credit to get back out of the city? Yeah, we give you one of these plaques here, but let me see what you got in the back first. Essentially, this is when, when the AI has taken over, so there's roadblocks set up, people are cut off from, from their data. It's the most Hollywood scene, if you're averse to that one. Um, so, uh, and so just the last thing, um, we wanted to visualize somehow what's the, what's the computer. We've got the first AI, and we would need to get to the, uh, that we're calling I2, um, or I1. And so what's I3? And um, obviously, if you're looking at the singularity, one, one hypothesis is just that the computer would improve itself, um, and it does that to some extent, but we're also making the, um, in this scenario, we're saying that the computer has to build something beyond it, and so it ends up building what we're calling I3, and we needed a good visualization for that, something that looked like something that it could actually build, um, but something that we might not be able to. So here's, again, some test shots of what that will look like. So we wanted to leave lots of time for Questions come on So Connie, do you want to introduce yourself? Connie works here. Well, go ahead. Hi, my name is Connie Seekers. I actually um, work for NetApp, which is kind of ironic. Um, we did the film right before I actually got hired here. So, and, um, yeah, I thought it was really funny that it was being hosted here. And um, I'm an illustrator and graphic designer. Yes. So. Uh, no, it's, it's been about four years, um, and it was two and a half months of shooting, two months of shooting. Um, we went up to Seattle, Connie, uh, we did a trip up there to get the end stuff, but it was about a year of writing, a um, couple months of shooting, and two years since then now. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Are you saying the shooting is done, or you just... Shooting's done, yeah. Yeah, so it's been effects and editing, and that's that's a lot of the hard part. I was off in London for a year, so I was doing a lot of things by myself, and then we got back, and I have a day job, and it's busy. I'm a strategy consultant, and so um, yeah, so this is this is it's taken some time. So you did the story, the storyboard, I guess, in the, in the business, and then you did the shooting to match that. Is that Exactly. We actually didn't have time for storyboards because we were, we were. Uh, I went out and, and actually location scouting is tremendous fun because uh, you get to go see parts of the Bay Area and, and sort of bring ideas into life. And we had, um, we broke a lot of the rules of indie filmmaking. Like you're supposed to have very few locations. We had a hundred. You're supposed to have very few people. We ended up with 
probably 70 characters, um, because we wanted, we felt like it was about all of us in this situation, and unfortunately we don't have uh, quite all the footage to show that, but it, it's really about um, how each of us will deal with this. And we wanted it to be about one person, but we also really wanted all these different visualizations. So the woman in the bar is, is one of many, um, that we see how this affects each different person. How long would you anticipate the final film to be? Uh, it's a feature, so it's about an hour and ten. It's, not, not <laughs> it's better that it's good and short, we figure. Features are usually 45 minutes or above. So. Yes? Did you get the idea of the headset from Emotive? No. You want to check that out? Oh, is that the, the company that now has the... The EEG reader? Yes. I, my friend, actually the associate producer um, on the project, his friend is, is part, of, part of that. And so it's funny when we saw that and thought, well... No, what's interesting is we actually had these, these little... We had magnets with this little deal. One, one, no, what would have been much easier is to have no device. But it was important for the film that we have some kind of device that people could take off and put on. And so we had something that we shot actually four days, and then we realized it looked ridiculous. And so this one, I won't say it's perfect, but we tried to make it unobtrusive. I mean, that's why it was black, because, yeah, it looks cool. yeah okay, it works. It just looked like the motive. That's what I was like, yeah, I know, like I know. Burger. I couldn't believe when I saw that. I thought, that's great. You guys should sponsor the film. Yeah. <laughs> Do people know about this? So Emotive is actually very interesting do, because do they're the, doing... Do you need a contact over there? Uh, sure. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I definitely. I didn't know the contact. So um, yeah. they do like an EEG reading, um, and so it's starting to get into figuring out what you're, what you're thinking you. when you're thinking it. And what I thought is interesting about it um, is that uh, a lot of this stuff, this brain scanning stuff, people are starting now to be able to move limbs with brain scanning, and they're looking at... at what your, what your moods are like and things like that. I think it's interesting to think about recording that, um, not so much on a regular basis uh, during the day, but also times when you might have forgotten what happened. Like imagine wearing the emotive when you're, you go out drinking and then, then you black out and you say, did I have a good time? <laughs> you can find out. Other questions? Anything big data? Oh, sorry. Uh, well, it really did come up with this, come out of the, the singularity thing and thinking about this um, five days beforehand. And then also, I've really been thinking about the internet in our head, um, mixed reality, all that stuff, and it seemed like the two kind of shared, <coughs> shared the same space. Um, that it's all kind of near future, and we wanted to, obviously we knew we couldn't do flying cars and things like that, so we just had to ignore that, I figured. Um, sort of like the Godard movie. but that, So it was just a synthesis of those ideas and then coming up with a story that we could tell. And I was a bike messenger. If anybody thinks I stole off William Gibson, I didn't. I was a bike messenger before I read Virtual Night. He actually has a story about glasses and, and bike messengers. Well, a couple of questions. Um, who is the audience for that? And where would you play the movie? And second off, are you hoping to steer um, a discussion about the data and some other philosophical aspect of where we're going? Is that what you Absolutely. So I think um, film's release is very interesting. Um, it's kind of got this whole staged process. So I'm going to uh, the American film market in two weeks. Um, we actually ran a Kickstarter to fund the post-production. I worked at Solar City. I used stock options to pay for the film, but until we got to the end. Um, and so we had a Kickstarter, and it was interesting that most of the interest was worldwide, and it was um, a lot of Scandinavian um, interest, uh, People in Spain, people who are interested in the singularity, people who are interested in mixed reality. We got Boing Boing, um, Singularity Hub, uh, a couple of other blogs that, that we're really excited about. I think it's interesting that smaller films tend to do well with subcultures. Believe it or not, the most successful small films are little horror, horror movies. And I don't watch them, but there's a whole category of people who watch them all the time. And then they watch low budget horror movies. So um, we think that. Uh, at the beginning, the idea was to create something that was um, that people who understood the singularity and who were science fiction fans would, would get into, but also something that was accessible. And so that's why there is some of the more entertaining stuff in the film, uh, because we didn't want it to be a, just a pure geek thing. We wanted it to be really approachable 
um, film, and it was really hard to navigate that through the course of it. How much do we um, give information to people who already know it, and how much do we provide information for people who don't? How much do we have things that are more on the entertainment side, and how much do we really get into the, the details of, of how things work? Um, I'd actually love to do a documentary on uh, neural networks because I don't think anybody's done it properly yet. Mm -hmm. And I think they're fascinating. We all should know about them because they're how our brains work. Um, but that's kind of a documentary thing. But anyway, we'll end up going to film festivals. Um, we'll see who we get in, you know, which ones we get into. Uh, so it'll be a whole layered effort of festivals. Then you do try and get the theatrical distribution. Um, I think we're probably more likely to get theatrical distribution in Europe and Asia than in the U.S. because I think, unfortunately, our audience is less intellectual, and um, and uh, then DVD and that sort of thing, and then digital downloads. And believe it or not, Netflix is where films go to die. Um, the most Netflix has ever paid for an indie film is fifteen thousand dollars, and that's the most for any film ever, and that's for unlimited downloads, and so that's the last stop. Um, but we'll see who likes it. Yes? In this singularity idea, I1 creates I2, creates I3, creates I4. Have you considered the idea of what would happen if one of these links ceases to exist and how the future links would be searching for their, their creator? We didn't consider that in the film. I've heard it discussed. Um, some people said, what if I2, if it's so smart, why would it create I3? Because it might erase it. And my answer is, well, we're doing it. So um, how smart are we? And, and who knows what smart means and what that means in the context of decisions. Um, there's definitely a lot of ways that chain could work. I think it's really likely looking around um, at the modern world. This, the I1, I2, I3 thing, we tried to create as a very simple stair step for the film audience. Um, I think right now it's really clear that we're in solidly in I2. Um, we're making things that not one of us knows how to make. Um, the cell phones in our pocket, there's nobody in the world who understands completely how that works. There's people who understand little pieces of it. The, International Space Station, you know, it's something we've put up there and Canada designed one part and there's an engineer who knows how something else works and there's someone else who knows how to operate it, but basically it's all of humanity put that thing out there. And so I think there's a real argument that we're already, um, whatever, borgifying. There's a possibility that, that we could, um, like the cells in our body, um, not know that, that the larger consciousness even exists. Um, and there's an interesting idea um, from David Brin, who actually came to the Kickstarter, and I almost fell off my couch. Um, but David Brin's a science fiction author, and, and the idea is that if you had a really smart AI, would it hide itself, and would it start manipulating humanity, maybe for the better or maybe not? Um, I ponder the next film um, where you have multiple AIs. We're part of different, different consciousnesses, and we can sort of switch teams. Um, so if you imagine that there was one AI that started thinking on top of humanity, and then you could sort of choose which body you want to, to contribute to. We already see sort of that with corporations, right? Corporations are like little consciousnesses. Um, they're not quite to the full um, the way we think, but uh, there's an argument to be made that as an organizational structure, they're very interesting, and they've got a bunch of cells that are dedicated to different things within them, um, and that they end up having actions. Yeah, Illuminati, the Borg. I mean, it all it all comes together. Yes. 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 They they blogged about the film, and um, and there's actually a couple Singularity films coming out next year, which is I wanted to beat them, um, but that's the bummer of a low budget and waiting 15 years before you do the film. So if you have any good ideas, do them now. Um, but. Uh, yeah, so we'll see. We'll see what they come up with. I think one of them, one of them is by the guy who did Independence Day, so I'm not expecting much. So I don't think that's even competition. <laughs> but, but the other one's Christopher Nolan, so I'm worried. Um, I don't know when that's coming out. So, no questions. Yes. Got an ending yet? And they don't have the whole budget. You know, the I one, I two, I three, and. Uh, we have, <laughs> yeah, you have to see the film. 
<laughs> that's that's there is an ending. Yes. Um, yes. Okay, I particularly like the scene where the lady kind of shuts down the guy volume because there are a lot of people who need to shut down. But um, how do you uh, rate social rate interaction, like social networking, at that higher level? What happens at that level? How do those things, whatever they are, how do they interact? Um, meaning, how do they how do? How do they relate to each other, like social? I think the film is explores that less than I would like. I was actually thinking that I would love to do a film where somebody works in a big control center and they're watching everybody on all their screens. They're basically like behind Facebook when everybody's projecting video. And um, I actually think it could. I, I normally don't like rom romantic comedies, but it can make a good romantic comedy where because the guy knows everything about the girl and then he uses all the information to to get the girl, which I'm not interested in filming, by the way. But um, but I think that this idea of big data and what what Facebook knows, what you guys, some of you guys in the room know, um, is really interesting. And I think uh, so. We don't show as we get a little bit into that interaction, and we start showing how the computer decides to serve ads to certain people. I don't know if you noticed in that scene. There's an ad that flashes off the wall, and that comes up more as we're basically there's this pervasive advertising that's kind of filling our world. And it's all targeted at us. And um, I think that that's the more insidious part of big data than um, even the NSA in some ways is that when you start looking at big data, I know that it, it hasn't been shown that we've been able to do good mind control. But I think on a societal level, consumerism has worked. Um, people spend all their money. They have, I mean, you walk, I was in my brother's neighborhood. And everybody's garages, their cars are all parked outside. And the garages are filled with crap. That's <laughs> engineered. That wasn't. That didn't happen by accident. Um, and so, as you get the power to see what works on people, and I think the thing with consumerism is that we're all susceptible at a certain time. It's not that all advertising works. It's it's finding the chink in your emotional armor, which is what she's talking about. The time you're tired. The thing you're passionate about. That you love photography. So don't you want to get this widget to help you make make better photos? We're all susceptible to something. You know how advertised, advertisers get to your kids, so your kids nag you because that's then you're just exhausted, and so you just buy them the thing. Um, I think we're going to see more and more of that, and it's and it's actually a real concern. And I was asked in an interview before this, um, what would I say to people? What advice would I give to people who are involved with big data? And I say I feel like there needs to be some sharing, and you touched on this too that. Um, you're pulling all this data out of us, and we're giving it to you. But th there needs to be an exchange. And one, OK Cupid has actually done some of that, where they've said, "Here's some of the results we've gotten." They published some really interesting articles on um, what questions people tend to answer, and really interesting things about humanity. And I hope that people who are doing big data take that. As I know, there's stuff that's proprietary, and you're learning things that are trade secrets, and you want to hang on to that. But stuff that isn't. Let people know, you know, what, what are you finding out about us? Um, I'm curious, what because when you see that thing, um, people have done some really interesting analysis of, of Google's book, you know, all the scanned books. And they've been able to do stuff with that data that could have never been done without scanning them all and, and getting them all digitally. Like, how do words propagate over the years? And, and how do we think about time and things like that? And I feel like people who have those big data sets, if there's anything you can do to make them transparent or parts of them transparent or some of the findings transparent and release them, I think uh, you sort of owe it to the people whose data it is. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, good. <laughs> could, you, could you share your... Definitely. Um, I think, for one thing, being a part of the film was just a great experience. It's, it was actually one of the first films I got flown out to a different state to, uh, to film. Um, but the perception of the film did you know, strike my interest um, about how these devices pretty much are linked to you and, and controls everything that you think and 
you know, even your dreams, it, it records your dreams, it record, records your memories, and you can go back and you can watch your memories um, that you can't really do now these days, but we, but we dream of it. And I bet you that, you know, a few years from now, we're going to come out with some kind of technology that's going to, to do that. Um, so it's great to be involved in something like this because it's, it's a look at the future, kind of, and it's, and it's a little scary as well. Um, so as data grows, it's, it's interesting to kind of make these films um, a reality. So I have two questions. Um, one is whether in, in your world are there people that, apart from the people that live in this eco-utopia, in, you know, in the boonies, are there people that can operate in mainstream that opt out of the big data and, and the device and like, you know, you know, the analog today, maybe people are deactivating their Facebook account or my, my dad refuses to get a cell phone still. So mm -hmm. are, there, are there these people that can still operate within the city in San Francisco and, and be a part of that world or do you have to have this? And then question two is, what is Connie's character and how do you fit in as the sister? And That's a surprise. No. <laughs> no. I, you want to answer the first question? I think you should answer the second question first. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm the sister of the main character, and, oh. and I'm pretty much the destination of, of the film. So, kind of the, I don't know, do you want me to give this out? What's yeah. your story? Okay. What's, your, what's your deal? Well, my story is I had a great, great relationship with my brother as, when we grew up. We were very, very close. We're kind of like twins. And something happened within, within the story, which I kind of don't want to give out, um, <laughs> that separates us. And I don't become a part of his life anymore. And I don't even want to talk to him, don't even want to see him. Um, so his journey, when he finds out that this guy is pretty much going to corrupt the system and shut everything down, the first person he thinks about going to is me. Um, so I'm kind of like his, his, his streamline, his destiny to, to go to at, at the end of the film. Um, so you'll notice that my character is always wearing blue um, because the device, when, when you're traveling somewhere, is always a blue line. Anywhere in Bluetooth. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and when you talked about memory, one of the things that we do is that uh, the main character explores his own memories of his sister. And so um, we go back in his, like, I've been visualizing for a long time, and people have done some similar things, but basically if you imagine video stretched in a column over time so you can pull back through it, and so we're still working on that interface, but that he basically goes back into his video um, and finds clips, and that's why the audience learns about their story over the course of the film. Um, as far as your first question, this is a great question. Uh, this, the next film, one of the next films I'm, I would like to do as I go to American Film Market and get this film out there and, uh, and I want to pitch it is exactly based on that. So the idea is that, that uh, we're in a world where everybody's got full mixed reality, meaning that they can change what everything lo looks like around them, buildings, all of that stuff. Um, and so, at some point, um, a virus gets released so that everybody can see what everybody else sees at all times. And um, so you get the transparent society, right? And some of the main character, who's a female in that film, um, opts out. Uh, she, she turns the device off. And she's, so she's in this world where everybody else is in mixed reality and she can't do her job, she can't do, um, she can't interact with people, and she ends up putting it back on. But in the time in which she was out, she goes through her own memories and realizes that there are people that she doesn't see in her own memories, her digital memories, but that she remembers seeing in person. And so she starts trying to figure out who these people are, and then she starts disappearing from everybody else's display. And so she starts... So I think I'm very interested in opting out. It's exactly what I want to work on. But in on. this in this world, in this world, yeah. no. There's a homeless woman who who doesn't have a display because she's, the implication is poor people don't have them. But um, and we had a lot of discussion about whether people have different brands of displays and all that. And it, it, 
gets complicated. If we had a bigger budget, we probably would have done that. Let's take two more questions. Okay. If there are any. Yes, sorry. I don't know anything about big data. This is my first experience with this. But um, I, I always, I've been like following um, like the singularity stuff, kind of just like whenever it comes up or read certain things. And it's always really interesting to think about that. Um, but uh, a lot of the stuff that I started thinking about, as soon as I started thinking about singularity, not that there's going to be like this machine that turns into the future, that turns things into the future, what we think is the future, but that people that are younger than most people that are in this room are, um, we're like all adapting to what's being created now. And everybody that's probably like, Generation. I, I feel like it's just going to be kind of the same as it always has been, you know? Right. Like it might people be. People have babies and then kids get smart. <laughs> people just make it better. But some of the people in Silicon Valley have had this experience of kids saying they're so computer savvy because they grew up with it. And then you say, you realize they don't actually know how it works. They don't know anything about it. They, they think it's like Americans think they're very film savvy because they watch a lot of it. But when they try and give them a camera and have a make a film, and myself included, it's a lot harder to get into it and do it. It's possible that their own blindness to their devices might allow them to see things that we don't see. But I think sometimes the people who really get into the details of something are the ones who think the most deeply about things. There was, there was one experience I had recently. I, I go to see a lot of music. So everybody there was like from 16 to maybe 20 years old, and there was probably like 50 or 60 people in there. And everybody's watching, like everybody perform. And um, like in the middle of the show, like I started looking around, and nobody was on their phone, or nobody was taking photos. Nobody was doing that throughout the whole night. And whenever I go anywhere, everyone's always on their phone. Everyone's always like, you got something in front of the face. Mm. I don't know what that says about young people at this point, but I thought it was really interesting. Mm. You know? uh, this question is actually for Daniel. Uh, I'm actually wondering uh, you know, what your uh, take is on the immersive experience of some of the characters they have in the film. You know, I, I mean, I, I was actually kind of tempted to ask um, Daniel about that. There's so many much thinking about the future and technology and it tends to be quite dystopian and uh, bleak and um, I guess also that's why I was also interested in your question about the people that opt out to live in San Francisco I mean I think it's one of my reactions is it possible to start imagining a future that is not dystopian that is not totally apocalyptic and it's not totally bleak what's that? People don't buy. I, I, they don't believe I, in I that. completely agree with you, but in order to sell, you need to scare them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's actually the story. It's not a good story. Well, and that's true of the trailer as well versus the film, which is something we put the trailer together where the AI is kind of this evil, you know, mind, and there's there's some dystopian stuff, but the film doesn't it doesn't end up having that tone. Um, the way I look at it is. We're birthing, if, if the singularity is, is real, for one thing, the, the characters, we're connected and we're disconnected by those devices. So um, people can connect in a way they never have before, and then they can also blind themselves, which I think is what we see with our cell phones. There's a positive and a negative. I agree that in terms of the trailer, it was more dramatic to have it um, look, come across as, as negative, and we actually think that the AI is it's kind of an, um, it's the antagonist at the beginning of the film, but that changes. And what I think is amazing is if you think of us birthing a consciousness like that, in a way it's the most spectacular thing we could ever do um, as humans. And, um, and I think we, we hopefully get at that in the film. Because I didn't want it to just be technology's bad, stay away. Um, hopefully it's a good message. Yeah. Cool.
All right. I'd like to uh, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Thanks. all of you coming, uh, the folks from Villa Montalvo and all our friends. Uh, we have about 15 minutes, there's some wine and food, so let's move the conversation. Thank you.